Jeff, will you grab Jacob? Hey, Joe, how you doing? Good. Are there members coming, Bree? Yeah, we're, we're, they're coming right now. I'm starting, yeah. so you guys should go grab them. Okay. I'm starting, Jacob. Okay. Hi, hi. Hi, Brad. Hi, Costa. Hi. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Happy Thursday. On today's stated agenda, the council will vote on the following Article 11 property tax exemptions. Prospect Park South Portfolio in Councilmember Matthew Eugene's district. It's a 30-year exemption with 384 units of affordable housing. The council will vote on the following land use items. Blondell Commons, it's 100% affordable housing development in Councilmember Mark Jonai's district, 2069 Bruckner Boulevard, uh, two mixed use buildings in Councilmember Diaz Senior's district, McDonald Avenue catering, a zoning map, zoning map amendment in Councilmember Lander's district, and a site selection of a new 322 seat primary school in Councilmember Cross Menchaca's district. Right. Uh, moving on, the council will vote on the following pieces of legislation. We are voting today, it's a big day, mm. on the Climate Mobilization Act, which is our own version of the Green New Deal. Our planet is closing in on a breaking point and we must, we have to transition from investing in fossil fuel infrastructure to clean renewable energy. We have to act decisively and uh, we have to act now. And I am very proud that this city council is leading the charge in helping our planet fight climate change, which is an existential threat to our existence. Our Environmental Protection Committee Chair, Councilmember Costa Constantinides has been a real leader doesn't begin to describe it. A real champion doesn't begin to describe it. This has been just years and years and years of hard work, granular work, detailed work, lots of conversations, lots of negotiations, working with every type of stakeholder you could imagine. And I am extraordinarily proud of him and proud of not just this bill, 1253C, but a series of other bills, which I'm gonna talk about now, and then he'll of course speak. Introduction 1253C would mandate that buildings over 25,000 square feet do not emit greenhouse gases at levels higher than the limits set in this legislation. This bill would lower those emissions by 40% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. The bill would also create the Office of Energy and Emissions Performance within the Department of Buildings to oversee the implementation of this legislation and recommend future policy on building emissions. This is a very complicated bill, so there may be a lot of questions. Costa can probably answer them. We have the team here who worked on it, who can probably answer it, but um, I think we did the right thing here and how we set out the, the benchmarks and the, how we handled it. Um, next is introduction 1252A, which will establish a property assessed clean energy program, a PACE program in New York City. With this program, more building owners will be able to make the alterations required to redu reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions citywide. Next, introduction 1317A will clarify the Department of Buildings obligation to include wind energy generation in its toolbox of renewable energy technologies by establishing additional requirements regarding the construction, installation, and maintenance of large wind turbines in New York City. Introduction 1318A would mandate an assessment by the Mayor's Office of Sustainability or such other office as the mayor may designate on the feasibility in replacing in-city gas-fired power plants with battery storage powered by renewable sources. And lastly, uh, Resolution 845 will call upon the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to deny the water quality certification permit for the construction of the Northeast Supply Enhancement Pipeline, also known as the Williams Pipeline, through New York Harbor. All of these bills are by our chair, who has just, I can't even tell you how hard he's worked on this. 
and uh, he's been thoughtful, he has been fair, he has been detailed, he has been substantive, he has worked on this for years and years and years. The administration announced that they were doing something on climate change a couple of years ago, uh, but the city council has been working since that time and before that time on this package of bills led by our previous chair and our current chair who have done the yeoman's work uh, on this package of legislation. So I am incredibly proud on this really big day for him leading up to Earth Day to call up the chair of our Environmental Protection Committee, Costa Constantinides. Congratulations. Congratulations. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Speaker Johnson. Uh, you've been an amazing leader, uh, colleague, and friend throughout this entire process. And uh, when they write uh, what New York City's response to be in climate change, you're going to be at the top of that list. You've been a real climate champion and, and, a, and a great leader. Thank you so very much. And this afternoon, the Council will vote on a package of bills collectively known as the Climate Mobilization Act. If passed, it will be the largest environmental policy ever enacted in the history of any city. At the center of this is intro 1253, the Clean Tower Plan that will shrink the carbon footprint of buildings 25,000 square feet or over. These 2% of our buildings, just 50,000 out of the 1 million, emit 30% of our overall emissions. Our legislation requires a, co a collective 40% reduction from these buildings by 2030. That will be the largest emissions reduction policy ever in any city. Despite assertions, this bill has been, uh, been worked on for over two years. Throughout, this, throughout the process, we've worked with environmental groups, affordable housing advocates, real estate, organized labor, architects, hospitals, and churches. Our final product is a bill that does not pit affordability against sustainability. Buildings are divided into classes and are given a carbon number they must hit. The worst emitters have five years to get into compliance, and those ahead of, of the curve would have their compliance period in 2030. We have built multiple safeguards into this bill to ensure that everyone can hit their carbon number. Every New Yorker is going to be impacted by climate change, and that's why we have to do our part. We create good green jobs to the pathways to the middle class with this bill. And the other bills on our Climate Mobilization Act that will help us have a green energy revolution. Intro 1317, which clears red tape for large wind turbines. The application process currently is a little bit complicated. Despite what our president may say about wind energy, wind energy, it does not cause cancer. It creates opportunities for a healthier city. Uh, we have to stop powering New York City off the backs of EJ communities. That's why we need to have a plan to close power plants in the city of New York, and intro 1318 does that. So I know in my neighborhood, Big Alice, is next to the Queensbridge houses, the Ravenswood houses, and the Astoria houses. We need to break that cycle of, psych of putting these gas-powered power plants in environmental justice neighborhoods. These bills are a down payment on the future for our kids to make it a greener, brighter, safer New York City. We have the opportunity today to reimagine what New York City can be, and we can have our own Green New Deal. The clock is ticking, the IPCC report, Donald Trump's own report says we have 11 years to take action. I can say that in confidence that we've answered that call through this great action of the City Council and all of my great colleagues here today and all of their great bills. They've said that the future is either Mad Max or the Hunger Games. We reject that. We say we're going to pass, you know, put together a future that is an amazing place for New York for the next 400 years by fighting climate change. So thank you, Speaker Johnson. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Good day. Good day thank for you. you. You did an amazing job, Costa. Uh, next, we have two bills sponsored by Councilmember Rafael Espinal, another leader on environmental issues. Introduction 1031A would require the Office of Alternative Energy to post and maintain links on its website to information regarding the installation of green roofs and other resources and materials regarding green roof systems. And introduction 1032A will require the inclusion of sustainable roof zones, a photovoltaic uh, electricity generating system on uh, or a green roof in new construction and buildings undergoing major renovations. Uh, Councilmember Espinal isn't here.
here, but if he arrives, he can speak on these bills. Next, introduction 276, <coughs> sponsored by Councilmember Donovan Richards, would adjust the requirements of introduction 1032A for certain smaller residential buildings. It would also require the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to study the impact that compliance with introduction uh, 1032A may have on affordability while allowing HPD to limit such requirements for certain buildings. And I want to invite uh, Councilmember Richards up to speak on his bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to uh, Chair Costa Constantinidis. It took me 10 years to get to learn how to say his name. Um, <laughs> but what a great day for New York City, for neighborhoods like mine's uh, in Southeast Queens. On a day like this, we know that there will be people's homes underwater. So when people say that these impacts are going to happen 10 years down the line, it's already happening in communities like mine. I don't have to tell you about the conditions of the Rockaways in 2012 uh, and the impacts of uh, Hurricane Sandy on uh, my community. This is why these pack this package of bills is not, like I said outside, a theoretical uh, piece of legislation. Uh, this is life and death for communities uh, like the Rockaways. Most of you know that it's projected that in 2050 that communities like the Rockaways could be wiped off the map if we don't do something right now to address the impacts of climate change. Um, so with that being said, uh, my intro 276 uh, will require buildings five stories or smaller to install green roofs, solar panels, or small wind turbines. And once again, it's unfortunate, but in my community we know uh, what the real effects of climate change were when our seniors uh, could not get downstairs uh, to get to the store, to get their um, prescriptions. Uh, we couldn't even flush toilets in some of the buildings during that period of time. We had to bring in gallons of water, gallons of water uh, up to apartments just to flush toilets uh, because our seniors could not get the basics. So this bill is just a common sense bill. We should be mo moving towards a 100% a uh, renewable future. The Greendale, like someone said outside, is not a new theory. This has been talked about in this council going back from 2013, work that Laura was doing and others were doing, to really push the envelope uh, on climate change. So I want to thank the chair, thank the speaker once again uh, for these bold pieces of legislation, which are really going to make a difference uh, in the long term for communities like mine. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Donovan. I, I was uh, remiss and before, because this has been such an enormous undertaking, 1253, the main bill on its own, uh, has been worked on for a very long yes. time. And no. all of the other bills that I mentioned before uh, by our chair and some of the other bills that you're going to hear about, the staff here at the council is incredible. They are the smartest people that I get to work with on a daily basis. I feel so fortunate to be able to work with all of them, and it's important. We always thank them, but especially in the lead up to this package of bills, they have been working overtime, not double time, not triple time. They've just have been working nonstop, and that work's been led by Laura Popa and Jeff Baker, as well as their great teams, uh, Nicole Aben, Tirza Nasser, Megan Chen, who I see here, uh, Brooke Fry, Austin Branford, Samara Swanson, Nadia Johnson, uh, and I apologize if I missed anyone. Did I get everyone, Jeff and Laura? Okay, so I wanna thank you all for your really, really helpful, incredible work. You guys are the best. Next is introduction 1251A, sponsored by Council Member Andy Cohen, and it will address concerns from building owners that say the grading scale of Local Law 33, <clears throat> excuse me, of 2018, does not accurately reflect a building's efficiency. This bill would call for the adjustment of the grading scale, assigning higher grades to the most efficient buildings, when the, uh, which they uh, then will be required to post. Uh, Councilmember Cohen is not here, but thank him. I want to thank him for that. 
Uh, next is Resolution 66, sponsored by Councilmember uh, Steve Levin, which would uh, call upon the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation that would increase the real property tax abatement for the installation for green roofs to $15 per square foot, which would provide an incentive for property owners to build green roofs on their properties in New York City. And I don't see Councilmember uh, Levin. And then our last introduction, Introduction 1527, introduction uh, by uh, council members Margaret Chin and Brad Lander. I'm having a little bit of deja vu. Uh, <laughs> would require that a five cent fee be imposed for single use paper bags starting on March 1st, 2020, and would exempt any customer from paying the fee who uses uh, the SNAP program, food stamps, uh, or the special supplemental nutrition program for women. Uh, infants and children or any successor programs as a full or partial payment towards the items purchased in a covered store. And I'm really proud that we're doing this. This council was at the forefront. We were at the forefront of fighting the scourge of plastic bags. It was not an easy vote, but we did it. We got it done. And I'm glad the state followed our lead uh, after a long battle um, to limit the consumption of single-use plastic bags. This is an excellent companion to uh, our bill is an excellent companion to the upcoming statewide ban on plastic bags. And I want to invite uh, Brad and Margaret up to talk about this bill and their long battle and getting this done. I'm very proud of their perseverance and their advocacy and their organizing. And we're going to make sure that any New Yorker that needs a reusable bag will get a reusable bag going forward. So uh, Margaret and Brad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well. This is a big day uh, for climate justice. And I'm proud to join uh, our speaker, Speaker Johnson, my buddy here, Council Member Lander, and my colleagues on a legislation that will bring us closer to our goal of dramatically reducing paper bag waste. You know, while we're excited that Albany has finally heard our call to take immediate action to reduce single-use plastic bag waste, we know that the work is not finished. To ensure that those flimsy plastic bags that are flying on our trees are not merely substituted by paper bag waste, which is 20 to 30 times heavier. And we must act to impose a modest fee, five cents, on these other single-use bags. Now, neither plastic nor paper waste it's good for the environment, especially when everyday New Yorkers who pay the cost of transporting this waste, including negative health effects that leave our children most at risk. Now, our legislation would also require that multilingual education for all communities and small businesses, a dedicated fund to distribute free reusable bags to low-income New Yorkers and exemptions for residents who are on SNAP and on the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program. I wanted to really thank an incredible coalition and advocates, and especially our school children, who were at all the rallies supporting uh, getting rid of these plastic bags. And, you know, this fight started years and years ago. And we finally passed legislation, I know all of you were there, uh, in 2016 uh, to limit, to reduce the, the plastic bag waste. But we had to wait, how many more years? Almost more than two years for the state to act. So it is past time for New York City to establish itself as a global leader to combat climate change. And I thank all my colleagues and our chair uh, for this incredible package of bill that we'll be voting on today. And, but change starts here in New York City. Right. And what a wonderful way to celebrate Earth Day this year by voting on all these incredible legislation. Thank you. You're here. And thank you to all the council central staff for working on this. Yes. Took a long time, <laughs> but we got it done. Thanks, Margaret. You're here. Every night uh, when I get home, my 15-year-old daughter, Rosa, looks me in the eye and says, Dad, 
today? What did you do today to save this planet that you're going to be handing off to me? Like, you talk a lot about climate, but I want to know what you did today to make a difference. Uh, we know the consequences. We know what's coming. What'd you do? And I'll be honest, most days I don't have a very good answer. Uh, tonight, I'm going to have a very good answer. Because today, after a very long time, we are taking some of the biggest action that has been taken anywhere for climate justice to reduce waste, to reduce our fossil fuel footprint. Uh, I want to give big props to our chair, Costa Constantinides, and gra gratitude to the speaker. I was in the building 10 years ago. I was not a council member, but I was in the building when the bill that Mayor Bloomberg and, and then Speaker Quinn had proposed to require retrofits was reduced just to require audits. And we're 10 years later, and it was a big, big fight and a lot of research and a lot of work by the staff, and I just have such big... Uh, props for it. It's a fantastic step. Um, I want to say one word about Councilmember Espinal's bill, which will require on new development solar or wind turbines or green roofs. So when we get to the Gowanus rezoning, which is coming, what that's going to mean is every new building that gets built around that canal and in that new neighborhood is going to have solar or wind or a green roof. Like we are building a green city together. And I'm going to be able to tell Rosa that today was the day when finally we took serious action to reduce plastic and single-use bag waste. Many of you were here about three years ago when we passed uh, the bill to add the five cent fee on plastic and paper bags, something Margaret and I had been working on at that time for two plus years and had great support from Laura and the staff. Uh, everybody up here voted to do that. It was a close vote, uh, but we got it done. But then we were quickly preempted by the state. And three years later, New Yorkers have sent more than 25 billion 25 billion single-use plastic bags to landfills. We've spent tens of millions of dollars to do it. Uh, they get trucked through low-income communities, and that's where we are. So we were so glad to see. And I think, it, as the speaker made clear, it really is because this council pushed and kept pushing that the state took action to ban plastic bags. But we can't just have people switch from plastic to paper, which is what will happen if there's no fee. The paper bags are heavier. They still got to get trucked through low-income communities, to waste transfer stations, and tipped into, um, into landfills. They'll cost even more because paper weighs so much more than plastic, and unfortunately, most of those paper bags are not recycled. What we've learned from cities all over the country and all over the world is this little fee helps all of us. Doesn't matter your race, your age, your ethnicity, your family size, whether you think of yourself as an environmentalist or not, the little fee helps you to remember to bring a reusable bag when you do your shopping. We don't want anyone to pay this fee. It's great that it will go to an environmental cause and to buy reusable bags if you do, but our goal is not to collect one single nickel. One great thing about this is, I don't know any other policy where it's so easy to avoid and it does such good for us collectively, and that really is the goal here. Thank you. Thank you. I think that vote was a close vote. A I close remember. vote. Yes. yes. Hopefully one today. question, Mr. Speaker. My feeling as a parent, my son is asking me for chocolate milk. Oh, <laughs> not about climate change? <laughs> okay. Oi. Uh, closest vote of the council, I think. Closest vote of the closest council. Closest vote last term. Okay. Uh, and that uh, finishes our agenda. I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. And I'm happy to first take on topic questions to start. Will. I am not an expert on this, and I'm not going to pretend to be. So I'll ask Councilmember Constantinides if he knows anything about it. But I can't uh, accurately. Uh, I would be BSing you if I tried to answer your question, and I don't want to do that. Uh, I mean, this is. I just heard about that for the first time yesterday. Honestly, what this is, this bill inspires to do is to create a green energy market. Right? We want to build an entire renewable energy. Uh, uh, opportunity here in the New York State area. So that wasn't something that entered into our conscious law. It's about creating renewables here in New York City. It's about creating renewables that are in close proximity to New York State, you know, to New York City, in, to, to New York State. It's about building that market out so we can go renewable as a city in the long term. 
Any other on topic questions before we go off topic? Yes. Can you respond to critics of the overall move in deal here like Redney? So just saying, look, this only applies to half the building in the city. Uh, and <coughs> I mean, that is a sad argument. Yes. <laughs> if that's the best they have, really? then they, well, this is not a fair fight because what the United Nations uh, panel on climate change has said is that basically we have 12 years to fix this as a planet or we passed the point of no return. It was 12 years last October, so we're actually at 11 and a half years now. And I am so, so proud that the largest city in the United States of America, probably the most well-known city in the entire planet, is taking a lead on this to show other municipalities and states and counties and countries that if New York City can do it with a varied and dynamic and complicated building stock from large buildings to hospitals to houses of worship to affordable apartments, if we can do it and figure it out with science and with data, then every other city can do it. And again, uh, we can get into the real technicalities if you all want to, but the 20% of these large buildings, over 25,000 square feet, are the baddest actors, the worst polluters, and the folks that we need to come into compliance very, very soon. If you are a building owner who already has made significant energy upgrades to your building, that reduction that is benchmarked in the legislation, most, most of those people that have already done that work by 2030, they're still gonna be okay because they've already done that work. And then after 2030, we're gonna look at new technology. This panel we've created with this new office in the Department of Buildings will set additional benchmarks after 2030, looking at the most recent data, most recent science, and newest technology. So, uh, Rebney should not be chicken little. They should deal with the facts and the science and the existential threat that is facing our planet, and that's what the city council is doing today. Joe. Just to follow up on that, um, I think part of the argument was that it would be harder to get these over the board building changes sort of like presented or carved out of the legislation. Can you just talk about the thinking process about who is exempt and why and how that works? Sure. I'll have the chair come up and, and fill in the blanks where I, where I don't get this entirely uh, full for you. So we went, there were certain categories. The first was we looked at buildings that were only over 25,000 uh, square feet. And we started off this proposition in this conversation in not wanting to any way detrimentally affect affordable housing in New York City. And so because of the way the state governs our rent laws and because there are certain rent regulated and rent stabilized and rent controlled departments and buildings and because of MCI's major capital improvements which is being debated right now in Albany and changing the MCI formula, we did our best to start this conversation off <clears throat> and not do anything that would raise the rents or take affordable apartments off the market and hinder tenants. That was sort of the, the starting proposition, starting off that way while at the same time drastically cutting with aggressive benchmarks, carbon emissions. People wanted to talk about energy efficiency, that's important, but what is the most important thing is cut carbon, cut carbon, cut carbon, do it quickly, do it in a way that is achievable, and have a pathway to get it done. So we went through category by category, large office buildings, medium-sized office buildings, houses of worship, hospitals, the list goes on, and we figured out in each category <clears throat> what was actually achievable by having conversations with the stakeholders and the industry groups that had a level of expertise. We did that in coordination with the, of course, amazing staff that I mentioned here at the council, as well as the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, who were amazing partners mm -hmm. in doing this, as well as other outside groups that have a level of expertise to figure out what those benchmarks should be and how we should handle it industry by industry, building stock by building stock. That's how we arrived at this. And uh, I think we did it in a fair way, a thoughtful way. And uh, this is gonna make a big deal. It's really hard to even talk about this in some way. I mean, generally, because like you can't really see carbon. So like, you know, we're talking about this thing that is literally 
like killing the planet and, and on a coastal city that's endangering us and and we're talking about years ahead of time and you know who knows what will prevent the storms that will prevent the climate change will prevent the flooding will prevent the environmental justice that will achieve by doing this now uh, it's hard for people to sometimes wrap their brain around it, but when you see the effects that are happening all around the globe, you see what's happening in Antarctica, you see what's happening in coastal cities with rising sea tide, you see what's happening with hurricanes, with storm surge, we have to act now, and we are the leader on this. We're not just talking about the Green New Deal, this is the Green New Deal. I did it? I can't it? say okay, it better than that. Okay, okay, all right, okay. Uh, Noah. I mean, so these we again I mean, just to sort of reiterate what the speaker just said. These were done uh, in a way that we knew they would be achievable, that the, each class could actually meet those goals. Uh, when you know when it came to hospitals, there are federal and state regulations that govern uh, their systems. Right? They have to circulate the air 15 times an hour in a room, and where here we have to circulate it three times an hour. So you want to make sure that you're doing it in a way that recognizes the unique nature of each type of building, and ensures that there are achievable goals that can be met for those different types of building stock. And can you just elaborate a little bit on penalties? Like, what's the consequences if you don't hit your target? Well, the, the, the whole purpose of the penalty is to make sure that nobody writes this off as a cost of doing business, right? There is, that's why we're passing the PACE legislation today to help building owners get the low interest, no interest loans uh, for their buildings. That's why we're creating the office of OBEEP to help building owners uh, work and uh, get the technical assistance that they need. That's why you know, the retrofit accelerator is being expanded in order to get the dollars uh, to help with that technical expertise. That's why you know, we provide different things into the bill that help uh, buildings. They really can't get that number. And also the opportunity to buy green credits, right? Help building our green energy market in the New York City area and the New York uh, State area to ensure that we're bringing more renewable energy, which a cleaner grid benefits everyone. And then, you know, one thing is most buildings that make these upgrades, they're actually going to see the money come back to them and the energy savings they see after a period of time. So their investment will actually uh, pay off in the end because they're going to pay less in energy costs moving forward when they have a building that's more energy efficient. I forgot to mention, uh, he's not passing a bill today, but he is getting a new school, which is just as exciting. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Crossman Chalk is here. And if Councilmember Espinal wants to come up and talk about uh, his very exciting <coughs> bills on, on green roofs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for your leadership for making this happen, and Chair Costa. Uh, I do have a package of bills, and it's to really incentivize and manda mandate uh, green roofs on all buildings moving forward. Uh, my bills cover commercial buildings. Donald Richards' bill uh, covers uh, residential buildings, and this is something that you can actually see. And we see it, in, and when we look at the top of the Barclays Center, the Barclays Center right now is covered in, in, in green. And what that means is that it's, it's a technology that's going to imp improve our air quality, uh, lower the car emissions of the buildings, uh, be able to retain water so we're not dumping in sewage into our waterways. Mm -hmm. And it's a real Swiss army knife in not only fighting climate change, but also improving the quality of living in our city. You know, we talk about uh, over 1,200 people every single year who die because of air uh, uh, because of uh, uh, breathing related illnesses because of the poor air quality in our city. When we talk about the children with asthma in East New York. So this is, uh, I think, a way where we're going to address a lot of these issues. A lot of cities already have been ahead on this curve, but what really makes this unique in New York City is that we're mandating for 100 percent of uh, unused uh, roof space to be covered in green as opposed to other cities that are doing 25 to 50 percent. So I'm really excited about this. We're si really setting a tone here across the country and the globe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, you've been a real leader on this and everything that you've done. So congratulations, Rafael. Uh, anything else that's on topic? Aaron. The estimate, it depends on the building, but the aggregate estimate uh, for city buildings is billions of dollars, right? Four billion dollars about the times for citywide for all the buildings, but that's ramping up over uh, multiple years by 2050. So it's not okay. <laughs> It's multiple billions of dollars.
but you can't put a price tag on uh, life on Earth. Uh, any other? Yes, sir. Tell me your name. Yeah, I'm David. I'm Angel from the news. Great. Um, so there was a, a school bus electrification uh, bill that came up some cars back in the day. Uh, <coughs> We're still working on it. Uh, we're not against it. It's a great bill. Uh, we only had a certain amount of time in negotiating all these bills, finalizing all these bills. It's not in the package because we're against it. It just, we were working on all these bills that I talked about, which were very, very complicated. So I think you'll see that bill uh, soon, uh, hopefully sometime this year, uh, but we're still working on it. Don't read into it that it's not being voted on today. Anything else on topic? Okay, off topic. Will. What, what's your feeling on the uh, potential uh, liberalization of the street vendor permit system, the creation of more permits, the expansion of the establishment of an enforcement business unit? I think the uh, vendor permit system is very, very broken. And it has created um, an underground uh, market that um, has inflated the price on the existing permits in a way that has really exploited low-income people, predominantly immigrants. Uh, so I think it hasn't had a sane look that's been uh, taken. Uh, the look that needs to be taken on this hasn't happened in a very long time. My predecessor, Speak More for Verito, I think did a really great job in working with uh, some of the colleagues here, and Carlos and Margaret, and a lot of other folks here at uh, trying to figure out a path forward. It wasn't able to get done at the last, at the end of the last uh, session of the council. Uh, I'm glad we had the hearing. It's a complicated issue because there are certain geographic areas where vending doesn't make sense. I'll give you an example. On my district on 42nd Street, uh, near the theaters, people can barely walk on the sidewalks as is. There are other places like down at the World Trade Center uh, where we don't think it's appropriate. If we're going to have this conversation, you have to look at uh, excluding certain geographic areas. You have to look at a dedicated enforcement unit that can actually go out there and has the expertise to do this. And I do think if there's a way to create more opportunity for low-income people and immigrants who are such an important part of our city, uh, we want to do that. So that hearing, I think, was a great start towards having this conversation. I know the administration has concerns. I know some of the small businesses have concerns. And we're going to look at all those concerns and try to synthesize it in a way that creates a path forward for more opportunity for uh, workers in New York City, while at the exact same time balances the needs of small businesses and understanding the geographic areas where it may not be appropriate. So what's your deadline for getting this passed? Well, we don't have deadlines. No. We, we, work on, we, we work on bills. We work on bills. It goes through the process. I hope it gets done by then. I mean, we're working on this hard. When we have hearings on most things, we get them done. And we try to get complicated things done. We got this package done today, which is very, very complicated and took years. We got the Uber and four hour vehicle package done, which took a very long time. I could name other packages that we've got done, but we don't set deadlines. We work on these in a thoughtful, substantive way with the council members and the staff here and the advocates involved. And I think you heard from my extensive answer that clearly we're thinking about this in a very thoughtful way. And that's what we're going to do as we move forward on this. Joe? Uh, there's a bill that's going to be introduced today sponsored by the public advocate and uh, Councilman Jaka that would extend the June construction safety deadline. I know you weighed in on this. A yeah. Bit, but I'm curious, do you support this bill? It seems like uh, maybe you're opposed to it. Um, I'm curious if you're going to bring your vote uh, to just expound a little bit. These tragedies that we've seen, the three uh, deaths in the last 10 days are extraordinarily upsetting and tragic. And being a construction worker in New York City is now one of the most uh, deadly jobs that you can have. And this council has led, before my time being speaker, on creating additional safety standards for workers across the entire industry. Um, I uh, am really grateful to the public advocate and to Councilman Menchaca for their leadership on this. They've been working on this furiously behind the scenes and coming up with a path forward. 
you know, the Small Business Services Administration should have released the money that was needed for this programming for the uh, training. And DOB, the initial deadline was December 1st of last year, but there was a provision which allowed it to get kicked to June 1st of this year. They decided to go that path and kicking it to June 1st. So I'm really um, proud of Councilmember Menchaca and the public advocate. <clears throat> We've been working with them extensively the last uh, couple weeks, but especially the last 48 hours in coming up with a path forward. And I feel confident that we will achieve a path forward that um, protects workers, gets the funds released, gets more people into training, and hopefully prevents these tragedies from happening in the future. And I want to invite him up if he wants to say anything on this. I think that you just heard the, the path out of this mess that we're, we find ourselves in. The deaths are not, uh, or I should say we're taking the deaths seriously today, uh, the last week, and really the almost two dozen people that have died uh, on, on my watch here as the chair of the Immigration Committee. But this is impacting a very particular group of people. These are immigrant, uh, many times undocumented immigrants. Uh, this, these these um, opportunities that we're taking is about training. That law and spirit was to get training out, and the administration needs to work with us to make sure that we get that training out. Uh, we're going to be combined. Uh, convening spaces for everyone to talk again, recommit to those values, and get something done. And I'm just thankful that the speaker and his incredible team that's been working on this is dedicated on this, and you'll, you'll hear some stuff soon. You'll see a path forward pretty yep. soon. Does the path forward happen before June 1st? Yes. Oh, yeah. So the June 1st deadline's gonna remain? I can't say that at this point, but, but you'll see movement on this very soon in a coordinated way between the council, the administration, the advocates and the folks that have been working on this issue uh, in a way that's in the spirit of the original legislation that we passed and that I think makes a difference on getting the training needed and getting the funds released to get that training done. So we've been, we've been working overtime on this, especially, I mean, Councilman Chaka and the public advocate and my team have been working around the clock late into the night last night. I think they were on the phone at almost midnight working on this. So they've been working very hard on it. No, we're just trying to, I thought that uh, a reporter in this room may ask questions on this today and we wanted to make sure that we made progress. We're taking this very seriously and we also wanted to ensure that the public advocate and the council member, um, we always try to be as responsive as possible. And so, I mean, I'm usually on the phone late at night working, uh, so that's nothing new. Uh, so yeah, we were just, we've been working hard on it. That's all I'm trying to say. Rich. Oh, the glitch. Okay, um, the Y2K. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, our technology committee chair, Councilmember Koo, um, has been taking a real serious look at this as well as the staff here. Um, and I was very concerned to read that um, great article by Willie Newman in exposing what happened. And we need to be transparent and forthcoming with the public when you have an outside vendor and contractor that we're relying upon that affects license plates readers and uh, signals uh, at intersections. These things have an actual serious impact on government functioning and day-to-day -day life. So we're taking a look at it. Uh, we've been having a lot of internal conversations since that article came out. And uh, I think you'll hear more from us soon on it. Yoav. They did? <laughs> they made some substantiated conflicts of interest violations by the mayor in uh, soliciting funds from, from developers who had business pending with the city. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and, and this came despite um, kind of earlier warnings that this shouldn't be done. I'm just wondering if you could help. 
put it into perspective. How, how, how big of a deal do you think this is? I think it's a big deal because it's important that we always ensure that we create further trust in government. That is our jobs as public servants and elected officials, which is raising the standard and the bar uh, in our own conduct, and that also includes appearances as well. I'm just digging into this, um, so I can't specifically comment on everything that was in uh, the article that came out by Greg Smith uh, yesterday afternoon and evening, uh, but um, you know, I, I've never been remiss, or I've never been uh, reticent or reluctant to apologize and to say I'm sorry when I think that um, I've made a mistake or that I should have done something differently. And so I think it's okay to apologize, um, and it's okay to take responsibility, and it's our uh, first and foremost job to conduct ourselves in a way that comports with the guidelines that are set out for us as elected officials. And when we have done something that is either technically wrong or just doesn't look right, to talk about it in a full and transparent way. One thing I'll say is that, um, I mean, it's separate from this, but and everyone, uh, not everyone, but some people up here uh, are fundraise. You know, we all fundraise. Um, and I decided a couple of months ago that I'm not taking more than $250 a person, and I'm not taking money from real estate developers, and I'm not taking money from lobbyists. And the reason why I made that personal decision is so that there is no even appearance of influence and conflict of interest in my practices moving forward as the leader of this body. Um, and uh, everyone has to make their own personal decisions, though. Yeah. I'm never going to tell someone when they should. I mean, I think people know maybe when they should apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, fun t questions? <laughs> uh, Summer? Uh, no, but actually the limit for doing business is 250, 250. yeah, it's yeah, 400, no. So no, it's 400, exactly, that's what I thought. I'm taking less. Okay. So the limit for a citywide office is 400 for doing business, but I'm capping myself at 250. But, but that's the limit, would you refuse any contribution to the limit? No. Um, my second question is, um, what's your take on the district court president election? For Jumani's seat? Yes. I personally don't know, I've never met, I don't believe, maybe I've met in passing, I apologize to any of them if I have met them in passing, <laughs> but didn't remember. Um, but I've never had a one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting uh, with any of these individuals, and no one's reached out to me to talk to me. What are you looking for in the next I hope that there's high participation in the special election. I hope that uh, people talk about the issues that matter in that community. And I look forward to working with whoever is elected to fill uh, Jumani's seat. They have big shoes to fill, given Jumani's profile, given his time in the council, given his leadership on so many issues. And um, I'll work with anyone uh, who's elected, as I work with all my colleagues here. Joe? Um, I don't know enough about the decision, uh, but I do think we have to make sure that uh, all children uh, get a um, great education, and that means getting an education in reading and math and science and social studies and all the things that equip people uh, to be able to learn more and be able to uh, get a great job and have good opportunities. And uh, that's just my fundamental belief as it relates to education across the board. But I, I don't know anything about the decision. Do you feel like people aren't doing that? They should be forced by a law to uphold certain things? 
I guess I don't know enough about it. I know that, I mean, I know sort of just in a foggy way that when Simka Felder was still the deciding vote, there was some influence that happened uh, through his advocacy related to, I think, the state education department. And I know the de Blasio administration has been, uh, the DOE has been looking at uh, yeshivas in Brooklyn and getting access to make sure that everyone's getting the education that they need. Uh, but I, I don't know all the specifics. Um, anyone else? Going once, going twice. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Did you like my joke? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>